purchase of the island. Now, because it's a compulsory purchase, there are a lot more hoops to jump through. And to be honest, we struggled for quite a long time because we couldn't seem to get any support from anybody for long enough. And I mean, I don't mean support in the sense of like somebody putting their name to something, but support in the sense of telling us exactly what it was we needed to do to achieve this part three buy it. Lat recently, more recently, with the help of the MSP and officials, as Anne said, from the Scottish office, we've had a lot more help in doing that, and we've taken a lot of strides forward. But it's still very, very complex. So bear with me as I try and go through it with you. The first thing we're going to have to do is hold a ballot. Now, some of you remember years ago we had a ballot. It was a, a, a very successful ballot. 80 odd percent people voted, and the majority of people voted that we wanted to buy the island. However, at the very last minute, the owner kind of pulled back and reneged on the sale. So that left us nowhere. We tried again by making a better offer to him. In fact, we offered him twice the amount of money. So then, as I say, we went to this part three. So the ballot. Now, <laughs> there are going to be two votes counted at the ballot. One will be a vote of the residents. That's, in the main, the people who live on the island, like myself. There will also be a count of votes of crofters. These are individuals whose names are on the crofting register, or the register of crofters. I'm going to get this wrong, so I'm looking at people to help me, to help me through this again. Uh, so we have to find out who these people are. Now you might say, that's obvious, anybody who's registered, who lives locally. But no, it's not that simple, because to fulfill, to fulfill the criteria, an individual has to reside in land that either adjoins Croftland that adjoins the uh, estate that we wish to buy, or is an individual whose Croft is on the register of Crofts. Uh, we'll get the uh, electoral officer from the council to conduct it. It'll be a postal ballot. Anybody entitled to vote will get a postal vote to their own house. They'll have to fill it in, send it back by return. The other part of the application is to update the feasibility study that we had made already for, for previous applications. And it needs updating, well, because the school has closed, for example. And lots of things have changed over that period of time. Some of them not to the good, I have to say, like the school and the shop and post office closing. These things have big, big impacts. And I, I, I think we have to reflect that in our application to the, the ministers in the Scottish office. This all is subject to, uh, what would you say, challenge by the owner, by the current owner of the land. So if we get any parts of these things wrong, and then he can challenge it, and we have to go back to the drawing board kind of idea. It's a nightmare, and it's really, really difficult. Uh, we were promised at one point that they were going to simplify the legislation, but it doesn't seem to have happened as of yet. Like I say, we've had a lot of help from the, the land unit and from the local MSP, but they can only do what they can do. We have to do the grunt work ourselves. So the next stage is that we um, just dot a few uh, I's and cross a few T's. We're working very closely with the officials from the Scottish Government who have been very supportive and um, have really made us believe that we are within touching distance now of our, um, uh, our submission to the Scottish Government to make the part three application happen. Obviously we've sought to do our ballot of the community but we had a, such a strong response for our previous ballot and with the enthusiasm that you saw in the meeting tonight I have no reason to believe that the, the next ballot will be just as successful. Explain part three. Part three is what's known as our Crofting Community Buyout. So the, the previous uh, ballot that we did was for um, a
ballot where we believed we had a willing seller, although that proved not to be the case. So part three is what might be considered to be a hostile buyout, and so it's a compulsory purchase. But um, the rules around that are slightly different because it involves um, the crofting community buyout, and so it's very important that because land uh, landlord would be changing from the Count's grandson to the Community Development Trust, that we make sure that crofters feel that their views are being taken on board and that they're happy with, with the focus of the UK. To what extent do you think the people of Burnra are ready to go for a compulsory buyout? I, I think having seen uh, changes that have happened in the community over the last number of years, we've seen our school closed, we've seen our shop closed, we've seen the post office closed, we've lost our care unit, and we're very conscious that we can't rely on um, public services to fill the, the gaps that we perceive in our community, that we need to rise and to take action for ourselves. And it's well known that um, by taking the, the next step, step and completing the community buyout, that's the way that we're able to, to start delivering some of those services. We've already been working with HHP and uh, the Callanish Free Church in the hope that we're able to um, use some of the land that's available to uh, develop and provide affordable housing so that our young people can stay on the island or indeed if they've already left be able to return. So that's something that everybody would like to see. We registered the company in 2013, so that's when we first started. And uh, we had a good, good rap, we thought, with, well, a good uh, sort of affinity, if you like, with, with uh, landlord at the time. Uh, but the old count died and his son took over from him. He wasn't left the estate, but his, his son, that is the count's grandson, was left the estate. And uh, he was a minor then, so his father was dealing with it. And we were dealing with him, but he proved over the years impossible to deal with. Uh, we got grants, we had a ballot, it was successful, everything went very, very well. We were on the point of purchase when he started putting conditions in. And one of the main conditions the first time round was that he wouldn't give us little Bernra because that was worth millions of pounds and uh, he wasn't going to just hand it over for the valuation price that we had. And that's where all the problems really start. So you've been fighting that for a number of years. To what extent is there now light on the horizon? Oh, it's excellent now. As you saw yourself tonight, uh, we've had a lot of help and support through the Scottish Government. Uh, we're now at a point where we hope we'll be in a position to move to a part three, which is a much more uh, aggressive buyout. Uh, we've decided there's no point in trying to deal with the landlord as he exists at the minute because he's not willing to deal with us. So it's basically we're going to try and compulsorily purchase it from him. With a lot of hoops to jump through, but hopefully we get you know, uh, We noticed tonight that there's a lot of projects already underway for the development of Great yeah, Burnra. Yeah, yeah these, are, these have all been done on land that doesn't belong to the current landlord. So we've been buying up uh, uh, Scottish salmon, old Scottish salmon land. We've been taking over land at the pier. Uh, we've been doing as best we can to deal with people who aren't the landlord. And in, or, and in that way, we've been able to move things forward because we don't have to rely on him in order to further all these projects. Uh, we've had lots of disappointment along the way. We've done a lot of work, an awful lot of work about it. Um, but it's really just in the last couple of years that we've seen that we we seem to be getting somewhere by starting new things in the island. Not so much the buyout, but just trying to get things going ourselves. The, even before a buyout, there's lots of new projects happening. There is, yeah. We've been working. We've got pontoons in Kirkabost. Uh, we've got a building in there which we hope to have a laundry in there. Um, and a few other things going on, you know, we're looking at maybe some social housing. Um, 
just trying to get things back going here because the, the island has changed completely. Even in the last five years with the school post office and the shop all shutting. So, you know, we've gone through quite a hard time over the last 10 years. To what extent do you think there is no light at the end of the tunnel? I would hope so. I would hope so. I mean, we've, we've managed to get development officers working. We've been brilliant and just actually getting the time to do things. You know, we're all volunteers. We've all got busy lives and we're all trying to do something. But when you've got people who are actually paid, you know, it's their paid job makes a huge difference. So they have made a huge difference in actually getting some projects off the ground. What difference do you think a bio can make? I think even for some stability, you know, we've, we've all, you know, for people that have lived here for a long time, you know, we've known the count, we've had dealings with them and then to have no control over what we can do with our land and to, to end up being penalised because we aren't able to buy out, um, I think it would make a big difference if we actually own the land ourselves to be able to do things for the future.